Well, I assume I can start. <laughs> Hello, how are you? This is the first live interview of Meet the IAU Astronomer. It's a global initiative of the IAU, the Office uh, for uh, Outreach. And um, the idea is to join interesting. Uh, I assume I can start. <laughs> Hello, how are you? This is the first live interview. Uh, we have some. Uh, I am. So um, my idea is to introduce to you the, the people here and uh, our invited is uh, Jessica Mink. My name is Beatriz Garcia. As I said, uh, this is uh, an initiative of uh, IAU, a global uh, program and project connected with uh, women, women and girls in science. And today is the day the International Day of the Women and Girls in Science. So welcome to this uh, first interview. Um, I live in Argentina. As you can see, this is my flag. And I have the, the background of the uh, important historical women in astronomy, very famous women. It's not uh, the moment to talk about, uh, about them, but uh, it's good to see all the time her faces and her job. Um, I study in my country astronomy and uh, when I was very young, my topic of uh, research were the stars and the um, interstellar medium. And with the time I changed this topic for the high energy. And now uh, I am working in Pierre Rocher Observatory for the study of ultra high energy cosmic rays, which arrive from the cosmos. And we need uh, to answer several questions not yet answered uh, about the mass and the, the, the origin and why arrive the earth with such high energies. Uh, this is one of the characteristic of uh, the astronomy. Uh, the topics are a lot and you can Choose what you really like to study. Astronomy is the oldest science that uh, we know, and everyone is connected with the sky. So uh, now we will um, we, we will hear about another life. Is the life of Jessica Mink. First of all, I would like to say that you can write your questions in the chat or put the questions in the um, live channels. And uh, we have moderators which, uh, who will um, select the questions. Uh, uh, Jessica will answer everything at the end of this talk. So um, here is Jessica Ming. I will read because I don't remember everything, but uh, <laughs> Jessica is an astronomer and software developer uh, of the Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory, assigned, assigned male as, uh, at birth, but not since 2011. She was or she has uh, written data, data pipelines for a variety of astronomical instruments and widely used package of software to analyze a spectroscopic and image data from telescopes. She has been a member of the American Astronomical Society's, uh, Society's committees on sexual orientation and gender identity minorities in astronomy and the status of women in astronomy and has also worked for inclusion and diversity in her profession by helping organize 2015's inclusive, inclusive astronomy conference, uh, which brought together women, LGBTIQ people, ethnic and racial minorities, and people with physical and neurological differences, as well as various conferences, sessions on diversity and data formats. Uh, her writings and reviews can be found in the documentation that we will share with you. Jessica, welcome uh, to this stage. How are you? Pretty good. Oh, Weather is sunny in, in, in Boston and it's a warm spring day in February. Well, uh, let's start with the first question or the first, um, uh, not question, but about uh, uh, a, a position, a framework, if you want. Yeah. Uh, can you share 
about your life and why you why the attraction for the astronomy in your life? Well, when I was young, um, I first got attracted to geology on a trip into the mountains where I got a whole bunch of bought so we bought mineral minerals from an old prospector in the Black Hills of South Dakota in the United States. And that started a rock collection. I kept going for a long time. And about the same time, the first astronauts were selected, 1958, um, 59. And I got, I sort of, I guess I really wanted to be an astronaut, but I didn't really think of that as a possibility. Um, but I did really get interested in space geology. So I connected but, uh, geology what, what and astronomy. Then? Can yeah. I ask you a question? You passed the test to be astronaut or, or not? No, no, no. I never got that uh, far. Uh. <laughs> I have friends who did, and some of the well, not too many became astronauts. I think only one of my friends became an astronaut, and she was 10 years younger than me. Now, my friend who's the same age as me who tried didn't quite make it. She she was really enthusiastic and she figured out the odds on what she should do to get in line, and but she didn't. Make it. She did work for NASA for many, many years. Um, however, and uh, I did. I sort of thought about it, but I decided I was. I was too. I was always nearsighted, and I just didn't think that I was good astronaut. Especially back at the beginning, I was too tall and the wrong. I was. Yeah. And then later, I thought, well, maybe being a transgender astronaut's too much, and but I never was really in quite good enough shape. Now I have a. I have some medical issues that mean that weightlessness is unsafe for me. So I'm, 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 I've given up, but I did decide that exploring space would be fun. And so I started doing it. Um, I guess I started really thinking about it in high school in scientific ways. So I did like my, my um, junior science project by 11th grade science project was um, was that, basically creating was amino the, acids in a test tube, so. Was that the high school when, when you decided to study astronomy or when you I was were mixed. younger? In high school, I had like three choices. By the time I got through high school, I had three choices of things I wanted to do in some order. And they were, I got really interested in particle physics for a while, like when I was a senior, not until I was a senior. Um, but I was also always interested in planetary studies. And not really, not stars so much. I learned to identify stars somewhat in the sky, but I'm not really great at just looking at the sky. And um, partly because of my nearsightedness, I think. And but uh, you, other were things. A, you were a science fiction reader? I was a science fiction reader from a pretty young age, pretty serious about it. Um, mm -hmm. like. I read science fiction and architectural history were the two, two things I read the most in high school, I think, and some scientific books too. Um, that's why I got interested in particle physics. And I had a telescope. What the relationship with the laboratory? Did you, Not, did you go in the laboratory and put the hands on the, on the tables and the experiments? Well, what I did, I did um, in school, the school I went to, was not a really big high school, but we did, we competed in science fairs, um, both up to the state level in the US. And, um, and so I, I did science projects for three years in high school. And the first one was biology. And actually that was the most scientific thing I ever did. It was like on the effect of magnetic fields on regeneration of flatworms. And mm -hmm. um, it was a lot of fun. And I went to the state science fair and my junior year, I worked with a friend and we built a complicated lab apparatus to see if we could make um, amino acids from a primitive atmosphere, um, duplicating the Miller-Urey experiment. It wasn't really original, but we thought it would be fun. And we maybe succeeded, um, but we didn't get to go to the state science fair. We weren't quite good enough on our knowledge of amino acids. And my senior year, I did a, um, this is like, I did a um, project describing how a man, that would be manned at that point, um, Mars expedition could be done and computing orbits for it. And I wrote software to compute orbits and it was a lot of fun. And, but at the same time I did a national 
science fair project separately on language translation, which I got really interested in, did a whole computer thing about that. That didn't go anywhere. They couldn't figure out what category to put it in in 1969, I don't think. Um, so then I went to, when I picked colleges, well, I, I wanted three things. So my first thing was high energy physics. Second was planetary science. And third was architecture. And so I looked at colleges where I could do some combination of those. Like if, yeah, there's still an order to it. I was gonna start with one and go drop through. So anyway, I picked MIT because it was best for all three of them. And I got in, which was a little surprising to me. It was my speech college, but I got in and um, started doing physics and found out I couldn't do physics very well, which huh. then I switched to planetary geology really. And then it turned out if you want to do planet, you had to do astronomy. And if you want to do astronomy, you had to do physics too. And so I did as much physics as I could. And I did a lot of chemistry and um, other things. So I did, I took a lot of, I basically created my own major in planetary astronomy or comparative planetology. I'm not sure which it really was, um, but it's those two things. So looking at all the planets and also looking at them in the same ways, looking at and, and people let me through a little easy because I was studying interiors, surface chemistry, surface motions, atmospheres all at once. So I was like really holistic. And I think I found out later that in Dune, they have a, a profession, called, in the novel Dune, there's a profession called planetologist. And that's what I really tried to be. And on that so, time when you study, uh, you, um... Uh, see some differences between the men and the women uh, choosing the careers and studies and so Actually, on? Actually, I was, I was fortunate that I have like role model women who were my age. So I had several friends who were going through at the same time I was. So I only, I only spent a year in graduate school. I got a master's degree and because mm -hmm. um, I just went on for my bachelor's in the same laboratory. So I started working there and I was my first supervisor was a woman um, who's now a professor, probably a professor emeritus at Brown University, but that studies still the lunar surface. I mean, you study what it, you study what you do for your thesis for way long sometimes. And she started working on the moon and it turns out there's a lot of stuff to do. And so she'd been working, she's mostly been working on the moon. I started on the moon and then I moved to Mars. And I got more into using specific techniques. So I was doing spectroscopy, two-dimensional spectroscopy on the very first two-dimensional digital spectrograph that was in operation. We took spectra on Mauna Kea in 1973 and I reduced I, it. They, and this is also the beginning of a, of a history of people building instruments and not knowing how to reduce the data and dumping it in my lab, which is what happened. So I wrote a whole data reduction system. I wrote analysis software. I was like everything to look at spectra, reflection spectra of the surface of Mars. So that was and my now, first. Yes, and now you Go continue ahead. with this uh, kind of uh, research or you change? I, I sort of, I didn't exactly. And I didn't get into, well, I took some year, a couple of years off before grad school. I was married. My spouse was switching fields from artificial intelligence to wildlife ecology, sort of a big change, and sort of prepared for that. And they got, ended up getting a fellowship for grad school, and I ended up getting rejected um, at Cornell with a nice letter from Carl Sagan, um, who I interviewed with, and offering me a possible job if I was coming to Cornell anyway. So I went to Cornell, got a job, used my computer knowledge to work on, and on, um, uh, we were looking at occultation photometry. So we're just watching stars um, get blocked by planets. And the first one we did was Uranus in 1977 and we found the rings of Uranus. And I was on the flight and I'm the third author on the paper in nature. And that was my first paper, it was really exciting. And, um, oh, well. and I wrote the data reduction system and the analysis, I did a lot of the analysis software too for that modeling rings um, to get edges and widths and everything. It was is a very exciting um, thing to do. So I did that actually for eight years and, oh. and um, worked on satellite. I worked on looking at different planets. We did almost every planet in the solar system. 
um, and asteroids and um, different asteroids. So I wrote a paper on um, the um, centaurs around um, in between Uranus, Uranus and Saturn and Jupiter. And it was a really, I did a lot of interesting stuff, but there weren't a lot of events. And um, I ended up leaving there and getting hired in an interesting way at, at um, the Smithsonian working on a space shuttle project, which, so all this time I've been developing like really a, a set of, a bit, piece of knowledge on how to work with data. Like, now it didn't have to be a specific kind of data. I've already worked on time series data and spectroscopic data and image data by then, three different things. And um, looking at planets mostly. Um, and then actually it, I started working on some stuff where we started to look at binary stars with occultations too. So I started working on stars in this, at this point also, while well, I was still at MIT. And uh, how many people is in your group of research? So at the group at, the group at Cornell had four. Uh -huh. And we added a couple more and dropped one because one was an undergraduate. And so when oh, we moved yeah. to MIT, there were, I think, um, five of us. So it wasn't a big group, which was really nice. You could do that. It's harder to do that now, but they still know some small groups. Um, but it was a nice group. We flew on the Airborne Observatory that NASA had, which had a bigger crew. So we were not working all by ourselves all the time. We had our own instruments and we'd recruit students and go on long drives across the country, like a thousand miles to go observe, or down the coast a thousand miles to go observe occultations. So it was, I, I took off several times with undergraduates to go do these things, once with two and once with one of them. And um, on long drives with the van with a telescope that we took out and powered by the truck battery, which ran down the battery and we had to get jumped by a park ranger. There were little adventures along the way or driving south into Florida and having a sky where we couldn't actually identify the very few stars that we could see to light up the telescope because it's all before GPSs. So it was fun and I got to do a lot of observing. I went out to several bunches of major observatories in the US. So and it's like uh, to maintain the, the taste for the observation uh, yeah. the connection Although, with the nature. I found out that I like walking around the observatories during the day and at night, I like sitting in a nice warm control room and running the computers while somebody else was out in the dome in the cold, aligning the telescope. Yeah. Um, so I wasn't, this actually even started when I was an undergraduate, my first observing project um, when I was in my second year of college, second, second, third year of college, I guess, um, I was, um, I was observing below freezing um, and going, we have to, and we were observe, we were taking photographs. So like on film. So we had to go out, expose the photograph then go back inside and develop it. And two of us were working simultaneously on two projects. And we, we take turns at the telescope and developing film. So it was, a, it was an interesting, and, but it was cold. So that was my first introduction. I didn't really like that. Um, although in, in the end, I ended up 10 years later, I was a teaching assistant for that same course when I was working at MIT. I ended up back at MIT after Cornell, it, our group, whole group moved. And I taught the course and ended up being the supervisor to students who were going out in the cold and coming back to develop their film, which was sort of a, a nice turnaround. Um, so it was, that was interesting. And uh, yeah. so at, at at, when I moved to SAI, I worked on a space shuttle project and I got hired in July, and, but I had two months notice. <laughs> so I, I gave a paper in October in Hawaii at a conference. And um, then I came back and started my new job. And it was like, there was no time in between. It was actually really fun though, because I, I jumped in and they had a, a telescope flying on the space shuttle that originally was gonna fly, this is October, it was gonna fly in February. And they had no data reduction software at all. They'd sort of forgotten it. And they could download the data from the telescope and save it, but they couldn't do anything with it. So they needed a whole data reduction pipeline 
And I had written uh, several by this time, not that many, I think only two. And, um, but they were complicated projects. And so, and I knew enough astrometry that I picked up predicting occultations um, that I could write the astrometry code. We needed to convert the scans that the telescope did into images of the sky. And so I did that. And so we ended up not flying till July, which was nice because I had enough time to get the software running. And um, I did, I was in, spent like a lot of the summer in Houston, which um, for a person who's from the Northern United States, being in Houston in the summer is like being in the tropics. It was 90 degrees every day. It rained every afternoon. It's like people in the South and closer to the equator are used to this kind of thing, but not me. Um, but I had my bike and I biked around in the heat. And people were shocked that I was doing that. But it was fun. We need yeah, to so move that's fine. So that was, the next so then I came back. <laughs> no, it's okay. yeah, so I'll just say at the end, I did that. I came back. We didn't get good data because of all sorts of yeah. problems. Came back and then I've been working on other pipelines since looking at radio velocities and redshift, large scale, you know, large scale structure mapping the universe, more binary star stuff, similar to what I did at MIT like 30 years, 20, uh, 10 years before when I started working on it. And um, so it's been, that's what I do now, except now I spend a lot of time on equity and inclusion work. Great. And uh, what about, uh, what do you think about uh, the, um, the discrimination or barriers for women or the policies and infra infrastructure? Do you have any, any um, uh, advice for the, for the people here well, in the audience? I think, I think it's getting better. And I think people are really aware. I think one of the things that's happened where I am, um, Harvard has had like either fit close to 50% or even a majority of women grad students in astronomy. It's been pretty amazing. The staff is not caught up with that numerically at all. Um, and, but we have several tenured women professors now. Um, and the numbers still are. What about, what about the people in the um, uh, main positions? In, it means uh, uh, professors and directors and presidents and so on. It's moving up. I think there was like a glass, there was a ceiling, the glass ceiling, really for a long time. And people would come up to a certain point. Um, we've had several presidents of the American Astronomical Society. Um, the, well, the IAU, even IAU yeah. for several periods. <laughs> yeah, so, and I was just, I came to this from a morning coffee from a division that I'm involved with at the observatory and the associate director is a woman who actually had in the past been president of the American Astronomical Society. Yeah. So it's, it's, there are models and I think it depends a lot on where you are, what the situation is. But I know that in newer fields, like for example, I work in exoplanets now a lot. And do you think do you think the changes are do you think that the changes are normal? Uh, is part of the life or is part is a consequence of the women actions? Oh, it's it's a consequence of a lot of actions. And um, I mean changes needed to be made. And one of the things that I've noticed, so I've always had women friends who were in astronomy, and they've Grown. I mean, one of them, my best friend from um, grad school became, she was director of the MMT observatory for five years in Arizona. And um, so she, so there are people that have come up and um, I think she was probably, a, she probably, I think she at one point might've been the um, secretary of the, the lead person in the the Division of Planetary Science of the American Astronomical Society. And several of my friends have been in that position over time. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, uh, if people have come up, it's tricky because women slide into certain kinds of leadership positions, especially the voluntary ones. That happens easier than getting into the paid supervisory positions. And um, that's changing now. So we have not enough senior researchers at either the Smithsonian or at Harvard, where I also, I mean, I'm at Harvard, but part of the Smithsonian, but I want, we all work together. So it's, it's interesting, but I have seen that like in exoplanet work where I do a lot of stuff now, there are quite a few grad students, quite a few senior women supervising women grad students, which is another thing you really need to have, I think, for it to work well. 
I've watched grad students over the years, women grad students and what they did to survive. Um, and I think still the biggest problem is imposter syndrome. I think once you're in place um, more than as much, not quite as much as really real discrimination, but it's a significant thing. and something you can try to do something about. So peer support is really important. So I always tell people when they're organizing that you don't just worry about support by the institution, but you worry about peer support too uh, for, for any uh, kind of uh, women or minority. Uh, uh, the, the situation for the trans woman uh, is the same or is different? It's weird. Um, for trans people in general, um, it, it's a lot of it. We've, we've, I asked my friends um, before coming here today, we have a group called Trans Astronomers on mm -hmm. Facebook and I don't know how many members there are, but there aren't a lot and it's worldwide. They're over, I think we're up to 30 or something, um, but we don't have every transgender astronomer in the world, but we have a bunch of especially young ones. And um, the problems usually aren't coming from astronomy. They come from like where we live and the institutions we work for. So the big things we need, a lot of them are the same things other women need. And um, having peers, I think it's helped to have peers around. I know I gave a keynote address four years ago at the American Meteorological Society and, um, and for their uh, LGBT reception. And um, I went back to the meeting two years later because it was in Boston and I didn't have to travel far for it. And I, I thought one of the people on the panel was somebody that had been at the meeting two years before who was a trans man and had never met a transgender scientist before. So finding people that are in positions to sort of, I don't, you not really model yourself after, but to figure out that it's possible is really important for trans people in general because we often get really put ourselves off as much into a little box and not see the whole world. And I think looking across the world is easier than just looking at your local situation um, because you don't always have much support. I've been really fortunate that I have friends um, pretty much at all levels of my life who've been really supportive. Um, and I went through some sort of hard times um, during my transition, but not super hard. And um, I, got, I was married divorce. My daughter wasn't really happy that I was transitioning, but now she's a great supporter. She might even be watching this. Um, she said she might. It's a learning. Also, it's a learning. So it's a learning experience, and there aren't a lot of us around. So I'm luckily in a position. I'm not really senior other than in years. I managed to get myself in a position that was self-defined about 30 years ago, and I get to work on stuff at my I work on a lot of interesting things that people want done. So that's the good part that I'm doing things that people want me to and I like it. And I think that's an important thing for everybody who's in sign um, to look at what they can do and, um, and try to find things they like on a day-to-day -day basis. And, uh, connected with this because we are almost finished the conversation mm -hmm. is uh, why it's important to attract more uh, diverse people, more diverse future astronomers to our discipline. I think everybody comes at things from a different angle and with different emphasis on what they're doing. And I think um, it's just amazing how differently a woman will look at something than a, general, a man in general. There's like a width in how people look at things and there's an overlap, but there still are differences. And um, I think that really helps science because it's complicated. The world is complicated. And, yeah. <laughs> and, and sometimes you oversimplify, then you find out it's complicated. That there's things that are going on that you didn't know were going on. And that's life too. So um, I think people with different life experiences approach problems differently. And um, that's, 
that's the big is, thing. Is there any any special uh, topic or path uh, to follow for the career or to choose for the for the women, or you think uh, that everyone can choose what uh, they want? Finally, I think everyone should choose what they want because I think it's really important to like what you're doing. Um, I think not everybody can do that. That you, not everybody can find the thing they like that can also make them give them a living, and that's a challenge. And I've had to make choices. I the only time I've really had to make a big choice is I turned down a job possibility in science because it required a huge amount of time commitment that I couldn't give it. Um, at that point, my daughter was young and. I was trying to be a 50% parent. I mean, we literally, we were trying to split everything equally, which I use as an example to say that it show that it can be done. Um, although it's not easy and you make choices. So I made a kind of choice of not advancing my career in a different, slightly different direction. It was writing a data system for a satellite. And I could have done it, but they said, well, Actually, the guy who was in charge had worked with me on the previous project, on the space shuttle project. And he said, well, you're gonna to have to give up your bike activism. Okay. And well, uh, we have time with just a few minutes, four minutes for uh, questions, but here, here we have one, uh, which is important. I don't know if you can see the, the chat here in the Zoom room. But uh, I will uh, reproduce it for everyone. Uh, uh, do the members of uh, LGBTQ uh, plus community receive any kind of support from the universities and institutions in the United States? And if yes, what kind? So I think the biggest thing that it varies from different parts of the letter, different letters. For trans people, one of the big things we need, we need two things. One is we need support from the community just acceptance from the community. And universities can have rules that require like na getting names right, getting um, genders right. Um, and I think that helps. But the other thing is healthcare. And a lot of times it's hard for trans people to get appropriate healthcare because insurance doesn't cover it. So in, in Massachusetts, the state where I live, the state has rules about covering transgender care. And I have, I had choices of, of insurance plans through the national plan from the Smithsonian or a local plan for the Smithsonian Observatory. And I switched to the local plan because I knew I would be protected, which was good because I did that in 2016. And the federal government changed its policy toward trans people when the president changed. And I was locked into a plan where I had acceptance, which I, and I had surgery the next year and I needed coverage. And that, insurance company was very helpful. So there's, that doesn't happen everywhere. And, um, and also some places it's hard for people to just find a good place to live where they're accepted. And I've been fortunate that where I am, it's very accepting of LGBT people, including trans people. And um, so I'm active in my, my neighborhood around me and I'm and active in different local pol political and environmental issues. and. It hasn't been a problem. I switched in all those things and actually ended up taking more responsibility on it. So I'm president of a small nonprofit, for example, that works on a one specific 13 mile long trail along the edge of the city. So it's been, um, it's, it's, it's interesting. And I think that's an important problem that we have. I think anywhere from, in many places, it's country to country and here in this country, it's state to state, there are people States that have very anti-transgender policies, like South Dakota, just go pass a new law, and um, other states that have laws in our favor, often because of heavy work by the community to do that and gaining allies. And I was involved because we just got our rights to rights to public accommodation, anti-discrimination for trans people, um, four years ago, mm -hmm. and um, we had to fight a. We got a law passed two years earlier, and then um, people against us got a referendum on the ballot two years later, and we had to fight the referendum. So it's, um, and we won pretty sizably. So 
it's it's a it's a lot of work to do that. And I was not a leader in the battle, but I was involved. And um, so it's it's been interesting to see, but it's hard. And um, among my friends, it means we're limited in where we can get jobs. Um, it's mm -hmm. true, especially for trans people, but it's also true for um, people of color and people um, and LGBT, LGB people, if you live in a community that's not accepting, um, it's pretty hard. And so there are jobs that are in places like that. And we want the institutions we work for to work to change things uh, because the institutions are often islands of acceptance. And um, I know both Harvard and the Smithsonian have really good regulations. So I'm, I actually at one point made a list of all the different ones I could well. find. So uh, anyway, here, is, uh, here we have the uh, last question about uh, the advice you will provide the young trans kids and girls who want to follow a career of astronomy. If you want to I, close this I talk with, that, uh, with advice. Yeah, I think the best thing to do is if you really want a career, it is to be like a foremost thing in your mind. And I think um, for me, it was career over gender for a long time. And that's a tricky thing to do when you're young. And I think at this point, it varies from place to place. If you're in a place that accepts it, accepts you, that's good. I think the good thing is the field is very accepting. And I don't know if it's the very, very best, but in astronomy, it's been really great. And I've gotten into various professional leadership positions or um, involvement anyway, with no problem as a trans person. I mean, my other thing outside of the diversity inclusion stuff is working on the annual astronomical data analysis and software conference where I've been on a local organizing committee and I'm on the program organizing committee now. And I think it's, you know, that's been interesting. It hasn't mattered that I'm trans. And um, so I think it's tricky. It's trickier to be trans and build a career, but if you trans, when, after you transition, you need to focus on both and it can be pretty hard because um, astronomy is a profession where people really put all their time into it. And it's sometimes tricky to fit family in, it's sometimes tricky to fit other activities in. Um, I know people that have done that. So sometimes those are my role models as much as other, I mean, I haven't had a lot of trans role models in, in science and uh, I know some, there's actually somebody at a website that helped me actually in some ways with successful trans women, which included people in engineering, not too many in science, but um, I know other trans astronomers and um, luckily people that have, are younger than me have had it easier than people that are older than me. Most of them have had a hard, much harder time and I'm lucky because I did it late and I sort of rode a wave in. But I think it's easier now than it used to be um, and the trick is to really focus on the science as much as you focus on your gender. I think that's true for women yes. too, to be, be really, you have to focus on science and, um, and you have to find a place in that where you're comfortable. And, and then you have to find a position in field where you're, where you can do what you want to do. And so I haven't really risen, but I've had some really successful scientific things that I've done. And I've had the ability to work from literally from the moon to the entire universe um, with the same techniques. And so it's been really an interesting thing. I've like, I think I've written papers or co-authored papers in more different scale ranges than anybody I know. And I think that's been a really cool thing to have done. And um, even the ones that weren't breakthrough papers that were interesting and, and just having that whole range of interests is really literally from the solar, from planets to the solar system, to the Milky Way, to galaxy clusters, to the large scale structure of the universe. I've done all those things. And it's, it's just mind boggling to think of that. And I think that's the thing about astronomy where we work on things that are so many scales beyond humanity and, um, it's, it's, it's just an interesting thing for me to do. And that keeps me active. 
Well, Jessica, we are out of time, but it uh, was a real pleasure to, to take this conversation with you. And I hope the attendees also, also appreciate your, your uh, history and your, your advices. And um, well, from my side, just to say thank you, everyone, and invite uh, all the attendees and yourself, well, uh, you, Jessica, to be here for the next um, interview to meet uh, an IAU astronomer. Thank you very much. And thank you very much, the moderators, Susanna and Anna, behind the cameras, <laughs> behind the Zoom platform, uh, who help us um, to reach this, uh, this shore. <laughs> thank you very much, Jessica. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, all the attendees, and see you next time for a new interview.